Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Harvard Sim Basic Quantum Matter Seminar Series. We are very honored and delighted to invite Nate, and he's a uh, familiar colleagues and friend of Harvard people. And he's been very productive and prolific on producing a lot of works and very talented. We are really happy he will be talking about wave function collapse. And from that, to color is solvability sub sub to the realization of non-failing topological order on a quantum device. So please uh, interact with uh, Nate and ask him questions. Let's welcome Nate. Uh, so thank you, Jiren, for the kind invitation to give a talk. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, some recent, um, trying to review some of these recent works we've been um, working on, on, on the, in the area of uh, preparing um, interesting uh, topological phases in, in current uh, quantum devices. So let me just uh, set the background by telling you uh, what uh, we're going to, what I'm interested in. So what are we interested in? Well, uh, I'm going to talk, be talking about today about topological phases of matter. And um, uh, these uh, phases have a rich history starting from the 80s since the fractional quantum Hall effect was discovered. But since then, uh, uh, by now, theorists have already postulated a, a wide range of um, phases of matter that could potentially exist in nature that usually that goes beyond um, um, our usual understanding of uh, uh, symmetry breaking or such. So there are many uh, candidates for phases of matter, these interesting phases of matter ranging from quantum spin liquids or also um, uh, these exactly solvable models such as the Torrid code or the Majorana chain. And um, we are trying to understand these as low energy effective uh, sort of lattice models whose low energy realizes topological quantum field theories. Um, moreover, uh, more recently, there are even um, new uh, exactly solvable models of lattice models that even seem to defy this notion of being uh, described by a TQFT at low energy, such as uh, these fracton codes. Um, and uh, there are a lot of interest in those areas as well. Um, now, today I'm going to be uh, focusing on one particular interesting type of topological phases, namely non abelian topological phases. And what are these? These are topological phases that host point particles whose statistics are non abelian. So, what does it mean by non abelian statistics? Well, if I have two particles in two plus one dimensions in space, I can perform, I can take two particles, grade one around the other, and I can accumulate a phase factor associated with it. And if you looked in space time, you would form some sort of interesting link like this. Um, what non abelian statistics, on the other hand, is that instead of having a phase here, you can have um, your, your uh, two dimensional particle or anion can have an internal degeneracy. So you have a Hilbert space of dimension larger than one. And by grading, you can even apply a general unitary operator in this internal Hilbert space. So interesting that can happen is that, for example, if you perform the similar grading, create a particle, any particle, grade one around the other, and try to fuse them back together, you will find that they might not fuse back to the vacuum, and instead you might get some interesting particle popping out um, out of the fusion bolts. So that's one interesting thing for non-abelian topological phases: uh, uh, this uh, internal unitary and um, this uh, interesting fusion rule. So why do we want to realize non-abelian phases? Well, uh, bullet point zero is, is it's cool. Bullet point one is that in the future and in the long run, we might envision um, uh, using these uh, non-abelian particles as a route to realizing universal fault tolerant uh, quantum computation. And the idea is if you have these particles and you can sort of braid them around each other to perform uh, uh, quantum gates, and these quantum gates are robust in the sense that um, since if you separate them far enough, any noise will not in interact with your encoded uh, state. And so it gives some a certain robustness. But of course, this is a very distant goal. Um, the, a more near-term goal is that we can think to uh, what phases have we discovered since the fractional quantum Hall effect in the 80s and so far in experiments, in, in, especially in solid state systems, it has uh, mostly been these uh, fractional quantum Hall effects, which has abelian anions. But so far, it has been really hard to find uh, uh, states or have evidence that uh, shows that we really prepared uh, a solid state system with non-abelian anions. 
Even more surprising is that uh, there are certain non-chiral phases, such as the Tor code, which we have not even this, uh, have good evidence for in a solid state system. Now, this, uh, this uh, paradigm has ch changed over the past couple of years, where uh, what we started to find is uh, instead of actually looking in a solid state system, why don't we make one of our own, uh, this engineer one of our own? And that brings me to how we're going to create these quantum matter. Okay. Uh, uh, which brings me to engineer quantum matter. So there are two recent experiments, uh, one from the Harvard team here and one from Google, where what they did was instead of finding uh, an actual uh, system with topological order, why don't we make one ourselves? So what the Harvard team did was they uh, took some Rydberg uh, atoms, put them in an array, and had them interact with the Hamiltonian such that their low energy state corresponds to this uh, resonating uh, dimers, which has the wave function of the spin liquid. Um, uh, what the, uh, on the other hand, what the Google team did is they had a superconducting platform with qubits, and they engineered the wave function of the Torico state directly by applying some gates to a product state in order to prepare uh, this state. So uh, this has only happened like two or three, two or three years ago, and of course we were very excited of what other potential phases we can prepare in current quantum devices. Now, let me talk a bit more about the how, which is um, how are we going to prepare these phases? Now, uh, uh, a typical way to think about preparing such state is the so-called Hamiltonian approach or, or circuit-only approach. Now, what, what, what the Harvard team did was they started with some state in the trivial state, um, and they gradually tuned their parameters of their Hamiltonian such that you gradually end up in the spin liquid phase. Now, one obstacle this is that, of course, the trivial and the spin liquid phase are different phases of matter. If you're going to go from one phase to the other, you need to go through a phase transition, which means that if you if your state has some gap, that gap has to rather gradually close. And if you want to tune and still be in the ground state all the time, you have to evolve adiabatically. That means that this state might not be uh, might. Uh, in order to uh, adiabatically go through the phase transition, the time for which you take to go through the phase uh, to, to tune this might depend on the system side because the gap uh, goes as one over the system side. Means that if you go to larger systems, suppose they have larger system and they want to prepare the same state, it'll take longer to prepare. Now, similarly, what the Google team did was they, for this system size, they carefully optimized their quantum circuit such that it prepares its code, uh, the Tor code state, in, for example, uh, seven steps. But of course, if they went to a larger device, if they had more qubits in the future, it will take longer. And in fact, you can sort of bound, you can, uh, these, these people have shown that you can rigorously bound that in order to prepare a non-trivial phase, you need at least a linear depth circuit. And on the Hamiltonian side, it's also similarly that the time uh, has to be proportional to the system side. But of course, everything here is unitary. So that raises the question, can we cheat a little bit? Can we, for example, use something like wave function collapse or measurement to scalably, scalably prepare topological phases of math? And of course, this is not uh, a new subject. Um, using measurement to prepare interesting phases such as the Torah code in theoretically has been studied since uh, perhaps almost 20 years ago. Um, but of course, what I'm gonna talk about today is how we explore this idea and uh, in fact, what I'm going to be talking about towards the end of the talk is our uh, latest experimental implementation, where we prepared non-abelian topological order in a trap ion processor. And in some sense, this is sort of the first uh, instance where we can unamb unambiguously say that the wave function we prepared indeed has non-abelian topological order. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to make uh, a quick comment about what uh, other experiments that has led, have led up to this uh, experiment that we did. And um, it, it, it's worth noting the, uh, the difference between something called defects versus anions. And there's also a distinction between abelian and non-abelian. So I made, I made a table here. So of course, if you talk about abelian defects, what might be very familiar to you is uh, a dislocation. So, so suppose you have a lattice and you remove one of the rows, right? 
you're going to have a dislocation defect, which is what this cell that looks a bit larger than everyone else. But um, you notice that the whole row was removed in order to prepare this defect. And it's abelian in the sense that um, you can sort of take two of them and, and fuse them together in some sense that if you take something with one row missing, and fuse it with another with one row missing, you get something with two rows missing. So in that sense, it's abelian fusion. Um, if you come to anions, the difference between defects and anions is that defect is a one-dimensional thing with something interest, possibly interesting at its endpoint. Anions are a string, have a string, but that string is invisible and only the, the endpoints are interesting. So for example, the fractional quantum Hall effect or these experiments I talked about, which prepare the toric code have abelian anions. This does not mean that the toric code cannot have interesting non-abelian defects. For example, recently, uh, last year, the Google team showed that you can even create interesting non-abelian defects in the toric code with experiments. So if you introduce some dislocation into the toric code, for example, you can realize some defect which also permutes uh, anions, which make them interesting as a non-abelian defect. And they even showed how to move them around in the lattice and perform fusion. So you can, you can get non-abelian statistics for uh, defects. Um, but what we're showing today is uh, a little bit different in which we prepare non-abelian topological order. And uh, the, this uh, gives us non-abelian anions. And non-abelian anions are particles uh, rather than one-dimensional lines. But and non-abelian anions can only exist in a non-abelian topological order. So if you've seen some non-abelian anions, that uh, gives you uh, pretty good evidence that the thing you prepare has non-abelian topological order. OK, so the outline for my talk today is um, I'm going to review some theory work which led up, um, which, which built up from previous work studying how measurement can be used to prepare topological states of the Torah code. Um, I'm going to rephrase what people have known in uh, a sort of new language. And this goes under the name gauging by measurement. So we found that we can re repurpose or re rethink of the way people have been using uh, measurements to prepare, say, as actually secretly gauging a symmetry. And once we realize that, that opens up an interesting way to think about topological phases, which people usually don't think about before, which is usually we think of all topological phases be equally hard to prepare. They all require some linear depth circuit or linear time evolution to prepare because they're in a different phase. When you start, if we, when you put measurement into the mix, it gives you an interesting hierarchy of topological phases of what can still, what can you prepare, how fast you can prepare, how many rounds of measurements, for example, you need to prepare, and even how uh, we think there are certain states that still cannot be prepared, even if you use measurement as a resource. And lastly, I'm going to be talking about the experiment where we realized this uh, non-abelian topological phase for the first time. Okay. Um, so let me just. Question. Yeah. Okay. Just go, just, um, one, one slide earlier. One slide earlier. I think when you show down abelian anions, mm -hmm. you can't examples like uh, people study like Fabian type of a uh, infection by half type of a uh, polynomial space that may also be now abelian. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Of course, there's a, those are candidates, and there have been some experimental evidence for that, but uh, to, to what what I understand is that there are, there's some sort of like certain things that measure and check out and some other things that don't check out. So it's a bit, it's a bit ambiguous whether uh, it was really realized or not in that sense. Yeah. Okay. So all well, the reason realization of this uh, anomalous quantum hole, fractional quantum hole states, People are doing um, I, I haven't I haven't checked those papers too carefully. I I, I don't know whether they are abelian okay. or not abelian. I would have to check those papers. Okay. Um, okay. So before I begin, uh, let me just thank my collaborators. Um, this a lot of this theory work was developed actually while I was here at Harvard with Brian Dorgren, Ruben Brazen, and my advisor Ashvin Vishwanath, and um, and after that, uh, we worked with, uh, we collaborated in the experiment with Continuum, which has this uh, uh, trapped ion processor. And in particular, we, uh, we, there are a bunch of experimentalists who helped build the quantum device. But uh, I'd like to uh, uh, give a shout out to Mosin Iqbal and Henry Dreyer, who uh, really uh, 
did the nitty gritty thing of uh, talking to the quantum processor and and uh, did all the programming to uh, prepare the state in the actual quantum plan. Okay, so any questions before I continue? Well, here. I actually forgot to ask whether anyone from home uh, could, <laughs> could share me or that they had any questions. Uh, no, so far. Okay, so let me continue with the first part, which is uh, gauging by measurement. So to set that up, I need to review something really quickly, which is the so-called cluster state, and it will turn up to show uh, show up again and again in this talk. So what is the cluster state? Um, it's the particular short-range entangled state of uh, which is very easy to prepare. So both I start with a 1D chain, and first let me put in the product state uh, in the X eigenbasis. So let's say all the spins are pointing to the right. Um, I've labeled two species of spins, one called blue and one called red. Now, what, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm gonna apply a unitary called control Z between every nearest neighbor site. Now, what is this control Z? It's a two qubit operator and it's unitary. What it does is if this blue spin was up, I'm going to do nothing to the red spin. If the blue spin was down, I'm going to apply a control, uh, I'm going to apply a poly Z. So how do, should I think of the wave function I get? Well, let me first decompose the blue spins. It was in the plus basis, right? I can write it as equal superposition of up and down. And for every up, down, up, down configuration, let me note where the domain walls are. So you can think of this as some sort of Ising, Ising spin, right? And you can denote where the domain walls are, and you are summing over all of these. Now, whenever you have, and notice that the red spin is just sitting in the middle of one of these domain walls. So, if uh, if one of the spins were, if both of the spins were up, right, you're not going to do anything to the red spin in the middle. If both of them were down, also you're going to apply z twice, so that does nothing. But only when you have a domain wall, one is up or down, or one is down or up, that you're going to apply the z. And what does Z do? If the spin was pointing to the plus direction, it's going to flip it to the minus direction. So what happens? What is the state? This state is basically uh, the cluster state in one D is basically a superposition of blue domain walls with red charges attached to it. So you can think of a minus state as a as charge of uh, of the red uh, Ising model. So this is uh, some fluctuation of domain walls with charges attached to them. And in fact, this is uh, in one D. This is actually a symmetry protected topological state. Uh, now, why is this interesting? Um, uh, some some properties of this state is that, for example, if I change the blue lattice to anti-periodic boundary condition, that means that I have a single domain wall. Then I'll have a single red charge, which means that the wave function will be odd under the red symmetry. Um, the second is that there's some protected edge mode of this wave function. For example, if I put this on an open chain, you'll find that there's a fourfold degeneracy, two on each side, which cannot be uh, broke, which cannot be lifted unless I break the symmetry. Now, this tool will come, these two facts will come up back later when I talk about non-abelian anions. Um, but for now, what I want to talk about is how can we use cluster state actually to, to prepare the Tor code. Now, there's a two-dimensional generalization of that. Um, instead of the 1D lattice, let's uh, instead choose this 2D lattice, where I put red spins on vertices and blue spins on edges. Um, I again start with the product state, um, and then I apply control Z to every nearest neighbor bond. Now, what happens is, uh, before that, I started with the cluster, uh, I started with the product state, so the stabilizer, meaning the, the, the operate, the, the wave function, has eigenvalue one under X uh, for every vertex and X on every edge. If I apply this unitary, uh, what turns out is that you can think of an, a new stabilizer state which describes the state. So this is just the way, this is a stabilizer where for every X, you put a Z next to it. So for the vertex term, X now has four Zs go, uh, sitting around it. And for every X on the edge, now you have two Zs sitting around it. Uh, what is this state? Well, it's the so-called 2D cluster state. But now what we can do is, now let's measure the red side in the X spaces. And this is the step which becomes non-unitary. What happens if I do this? Well, first of all, the vertex term here, um, I'm measuring this red X. So I will get a measurement outcome, which will be plus or minus one. 
let me record that value as this little small x here, which is now a classical value plus or minus one. So I'll get that the state correspond, uh, the resulting state has uh, the product of z's around the vertex being plus or minus one. Now, what happens to this term? This term actually doesn't commute with my measurement. So it, you don't know the eigenvalue of uh, this operator anymore. However, you can notice that if I take the product of four operators around this plaquette, I'm going to get uh, the z's will all cancel and I get this operator. This operator now commutes with my x measurement on the vertices. So I'll get that, um, I'll get that, uh, I still know the value of this uh, plaquette operator and its eigenvalue is plus one. So what is the state I prepared? This is more or less Tor code state up to the fact that this, uh, you have the vertex term and the plaquette term with the catch that the vertex term might be plus or minus one. There's some randomness in the measurement outcome. But that's not a problem because I recorded all the measurement outcome. So for example, suppose I measure that this plaquette, this vertex term was minus, this vertex term was minus. I know how to fix it because I, you can think of it as if these were E anions of the Tor code. And I know exactly the string to, to move the E's to fix them uh, to each other. So there's uh, this operator, a bunch of X's, you just connect the two E's. What that'll flip the vertex operator to be happy again. And I uh, prepared deterministically the Tor code. So note that I use measurement, but if I record the measurement outcome and I use this at, uh, use a unitary depending on the measurement outcome, I'll call that feed forward to fix the state, um, you can deterministically prepare the Tor code. So by using measurement and feed forward, you can prepare the Tor code in finite time. So this note that this protocol did not depend on the system side. All these gates commute, so I can apply them in a finite time. Right, the measurement can all be done at once, and I only just need to fix this. All these can, all these x's can be applied simultaneously, so everything is finite time. Okay, so after I've done that, I've got I can always prepare the clean Tor code state deterministically. Okay, so this was known since two thousand and one. That's how quantum information usually think about preparing Tor code. You want to, you just want to, you start with a state where all the x's are happy, right? You started with a product state, and this term is already plus one, but you just want to project into this state. You, so you go ahead and measure this operator. Oh, uh, this, uh, you want to project into this plus one, but you measure this operator, it might be plus or minus one, and then you fix it. So that's how uh, quantum information people think about it. So you think of the red side as being acting as an ancilla for which you couple your. Uh, your physical qubits of, of, of the blue guys and couple this as ancilla and then you measure the ancilla to, in order to perform this uh, uh, measurement of this four body operator. Okay, now I want to flip this around a bit actually and recast this as this procedure I've described is actually secretly gauging a symmetry. So uh, flipping gears a bit, uh, what do we think, what do we usually think of when we think of gauging? What is gauging? Um, gauging is just projecting in, so what you have some gauge theory, gauging corresponds to projecting into some gauge invariant subspace. So for example, if you have some Gauss law, um, you want to project into the subspace where there are no charges. For example, the divergence of the electric field is zero. Um, uh, here, I'm doing a mod two version of that. And my electric field is basically the poly Z is coming out of each edge. So you can think of the divergence of E as being just the product of Z's uh, coming out of each vertex. So the charge, this corresponds to this X sitting in the middle. And so by measuring this operator, what I'm doing is I'm just measuring what the charge is for that Gauss law. Right? So you can, and indeed we have the intuition that the X minus equals minus, sorry, the, 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 this operator being minus one means that you have a charge thing, that's the E anion. So if we perform the measurement and we get the charge to be non-zero, then the operator I use to fix that is basically the Wilson loop of the gauge theory. Okay. So by performing this procedure, uh, we can project into the gauge invariant subspace uh, up to a measurement outcome, which might be random, but we always know how to fix it. So um, this procedure, you can act exactly think of gauging as, as gauging asymmetry. You start with some matter fields, we're living on the red vertices. You perform this procedure which gauges asymmetry, then you obtain a pure gauge theory living just on the, uh, the bonds. So notice that before that, I was thinking of the red 
uh, vertex as an ancilla, that's how quantum information think about it. You use that as an ancilla to perform some measurement. Now I want to flip it around. I'm, I'm actually saying this red thing is the important thing. It's the matter field. And we're using this matter field and this procedure is gauging the symmetry, giving us a pure gauge theory living on the bonds. Now, what is the advantage of thinking of this way? Uh, the advantage is that before that, when I was thinking of the red size of the ancilla, I always set it, uh, initialize it in the plus state. But now once we have this, once we know that this is secretly gauging, you can put the matter field in any way function you want, right? So for example, um, we know that if we started in the red, uh, if the red in the plus state, you can think of that just as a paramagnet in 2D. So you have a 2D paramagnet living on the edges. We know uh, on the vertices, sorry, we know that if we gauge this wave function, we're gonna get a Z2 gauge theorem. Uh, in, in fact, it's in the deconfined phase, and that's just exactly the torque code. But now we know that if we uh, deviate from this a bit, you only need to be in the paramagnetic phase. I can give you a wave function that is, for example, off the fixed point a little, but it's still in the paramagnetic phase. As long as you gauge this wave function using this procedure I described, you'll still get something in the deconfined Z2 gauge theory case. And, and this is just a special case of the torque code, but moreover, you can do this in general. You can even give me a gapless wave function on the red vertices, for example. And if you do this procedure, right, you have some transition between the paramag paramagnet to the ferromagnet. If you uh, if you gauge that, uh, that will give uh, me the condensation transition, for example, in the Z2 gauge theory. Okay, so uh, by flipping this around, this allows us uh, a wider uh, uh, tricks that we can play around in order to obtain interesting states. Uh, and we can apply the tools we know from gauging and apply them to uh, pr prepare interesting wave functions. Um, let me show you just quickly how to prove that this is gauging by measurement. Um, what I did was we started with some arbitrary, um, I'm doing this as uh, a 1D version. We started this, we started an arbitrary wave function on the red side. We initialized the blue side always in the plus. We apply this cluster state entangler. That's just the product of these control Zs, then we measure, or uh, uh, which if you fix can be thought of as effectively projecting into the plus state on the red side. In fact, you can think of this whole yeah. procedure as exactly the Kramer's 1A duality. So you can think of the Kramer's 1A duality as starting from a product state and preparing a torque code in 2D, or in 1D you start from a, a paramagnet, you end up with a ferromagnet. So how does that work? I just need to show you that for example, in 1D, I, I perform this duality where I swap the paramagnetic term with the ferromagnetic term in the transverse Ising model. So how do we show that? I start with, suppose I start with X on the red side. If I push it through this, I'm gonna get Z X Z using this uh, unit term. Now I X acts on the plus state and it gets, it has eigenvalue plus one, so it's gone. So I'm left with Z Z. So you see that X is exactly sent to Z Z. And this picture is symmetric. So if I flip this back over, if I have X on the top, it will also come down as ZZ on the bottom. So it's exactly interchanging the paramagnetic term and the ferromagnetic term. So that gives us uh, gauging. Sorry, question. Mm -hmm. well, previous slide, uh, I think you mentioned the 1D ferromagnet. Yes. And that's a gauging model for 1D ferromagnet. Right, right. Uh, uh, is that? So just make sure I understand. So in one plus one D, there is no real deep gauge theory other than symmetry breaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Secretly symmetry breaking. So you can prepare the one D ferromagnet, which is a symmetry breaking. Yeah. So ferromagnetic should be regarded as some Z2 spontaneous symmetry breaking states. Yes. And yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. But you can also think of it, it as a gauge theory, theory if you want. Yeah. Other the same phase as a symmetry breaking mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So I have one... a question. Yes. Oh, sorry. I don't want to interrupt the you're not finished the last question. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think you were. Uh, good. Okay, good. So my uh, uh, question is, how do I think about all this in the presence of noise? Doesn't, uh, so noise, wouldn't it um, violate the gauge variance? Uh, yes, yes. So if, you are, if your procedure was imperfect, indeed, there are some protocols which would be unstable to this. So for example, the, if you prepare the 1D paramagnet, uh, uh, if you try to prepare the 1D ferromagnet and your, your procedure was off by a bit, then, then it would be unstable. It, 
it turns out it boils down to the similar physics to the fact that the 1D ferromagnet is not stable to finite temperature. But if you do a similar thing to prepare the 2D ferromagnet, then that would be stable. So there, there's, there's some, there's some uh, similarities there. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I unfortunately won't talk, be talking too much about this point, but yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to talk. I guess I'm, I'm worried about like, you're gonna, uh, later in the talk, you're gonna talk about a real system, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and in that real system, there'll be all kinds of noise happening. And I just wanna make sure, you know, how do I think about what you're telling us here in the context of all this, you know, when we're gonna have uh, lots yes, of so, noise in a real system. Uh -huh. So if you're off by a bit, um, what turns out is in the thermodynamic, in the true thermodynamic limit, um, for example, the ferromagnet in 1D, what goes wrong? You will have your correlation will sort of decay with system size and it'll go to zero. But for finite size system, you can still see this uh, correlation, which will be finite, and you'll see the ferromagnetic, uh, so for example, ZZ correlation, I even see. if you are you know, we're off by a bit. But yeah, in the true thermodynamic limit, it won't be stable. It's only when you scale that will be. Okay. Got it. Got it. May I also ask a question? Yes. Uh, so, I, uh, so you talked about the robustness against the uh, the small deformation of the initial state on the on the vertices mm -hmm. on the x. But mm -hmm. how about small deformation of these CZs? So, is this gauging picture mm -hmm. also explains any kind of robustness? Is, does robustness exist along such a deformation? Uh, there is also a robustness depending on what you pick prepare. So, so we do have uh, a paper where we study a certain, for example, you can do control Z by some um, Ising evolution. And if you time your evolution off by a bit, um, for example, if you prepare the 2D ferromagnet, there is still some stability there, as long as you sort of, sort of preserve the Ising symmetry, for example. There, 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 there are certain, yeah, there are certain, uh, there are certain uh, uh, deviations, which will, directions, which will still be stable. But not all deformation, but just certain deformations. Uh, right, right. Not, not, not all deformations will be stable. Yes, Thank but you. finite size system, you will still see that. Uh, you. uh, you'll still see some. You will still see some long range correlation in the state you prepare. Any other questions? Okay. So let me make two comments. One is that this relation to, of the cluster state to the kramer uh gauging or operator, um, there is a close relation between the two in the sense that if you, take the, uh, if you take the cluster state as a tensor network operator, as an MPO, and actually if you just flip the two, uh, the legs up of half of the system, then what you get is exactly the kramer wanya mapping. So, uh, the cluster state is stabilized by ZXZ. If you put the legs out, it means that X gets sent to ZZ, which is exactly the kramer twining mapping. Similarly, in 2D, you take this 2D cluster state, you flip half the legs out, um, that, this will exactly be the map that gauges the paramagnet to the torque nodes. Okay. And, uh, and these red and blue tensors, uh, they're just uh, very simple tensors. You can think of it as if one of them is a GHZ tensor and one of them is the Hadamard version of that. And that also appears in, uh, for example, ZX calculus, if you, know, if you know that language. Okay, the second comment I wanna make is about what is the role of measurement in the sense of you can think of it as uncondensing or unfixing. So let me first talk about Higgsing uh, the Torrent code. Uh, what, what do we mean by Higgsing? I want to proliferate uh, for example, all the E excitations, how do I do that? If I start with the torque code, let's try to go back. I can proliferate the E excitations by adding a, a term that will condense the E. So I added the Wilson line and I added the Z for the matter field so that the Wilson line can end. This is exactly the three body operator. And you notice if you turn this term on to be strong, you go back from the torque code to the 2D cluster field. But this, so we can understand the 2D plus of say wave function as exactly a proliferation or a condensation of E particles with Wilson loops attaching them. So this is exactly the picture we have for the Higgs phase where the E is condensed. So what are we doing when we measure the rest size? Well, we have a superposition of all these configurations, right? 
Now we just go ahead and measure the charge. What happens? That freezes the charge configuration. The charges are hopping around everywhere, but now we're freezing the charge configuration to be at certain locations depending on the measurement outcome. So what happens is out of this sum of all the superpositions, the measurement is just selecting one of those slices randomly, right? And we get one of these measurement outcomes. So here we started with a pick space which has short range entanglement, but by just selecting one slice out, it's interesting to note that we now get a state with long range entanglement. And now for every uh, measurement outcome, we can fix the state. So uh, it's interesting to think of a long range entangled state as a sum, uh, sorry, a short range entangled state as a sum of long range entangled state. But that's exactly the Higgs mix. Okay. And um, uh, another thing to note is that uh, in terms of preparing the Torah code, we also did that using uh, this process where we go ahead and measure the maquette and, uh, and vertex stabilizers of the Torah code. And you can perform this uh, little fun game where you prepare the Torah code with measurements. You can even prepare it with a defect, for example, and uh, for example, move uh, anions around this defect and you see that the M anion turns into the E anion. So there are the little fun uh, games you can do uh, just with the Torah code already, which people haven't done before. Okay, in an experiment. Okay, so now I want to move on, unless there are other questions, about uh, what we can gain with the, uh, from this intuition to build a hierarchy of topological phases based on uh, unitary circuits and measurements. So I mentioned how in the Z2 Torah code, we can prepare that efficiently by just measuring its Gauss law, measuring where the charges are. Can we do that for non-abelian states? Well, actually, there are generalizations of cluster states to non-abelian groups. Um, and indeed, if you are able to project into the charge singlet sector, then that will act exactly perform the gauging. The problem is that uh, we don't have projection as our, a tool. We only have measurement. So measurement has a random outcome, right? And when we measure the Gauss law for a non-abelian uh, group, what, what are charges of a non-abelian group? Those are irreducible representations of the group. So you have a chance that your measurement outcome will correspond to uh, uh, an, uh, a non-abelian anion, which has uh, a, a dimension, uh, an era with dimension larger than one. Now, it turns out that these, these non-abelian anions, which have an eternal degree of freedom, that's the degree of the, rep uh, that's the dimension of the representation, um, it's very hard to move them because you, there's secretly some internal degree of freedom. So if you want to move it well, one step to the right, you sort of need to uh, not measure that information but, and move it over. So you sort of have to move it uh, sequentially, which means that uh, the best you can do is move that in uh, a linear depth circuit. You cannot do better than that and you can actually improve it for any non-abelian anion. So this gives us a problem. Suppose we try to measure this, but uh, we might uh, measure and find some non-abelian anions the, the, the price to pair them up is the same linear depth as you would have done with the unitary process to create uh, a non-abelian state. So what is the advantage here? Right. So, so we need to find some way to get around this. And the trick is if we can, we have a non-abelian uh, group, uh, the solution is as long as you can break it up into simpler components, all which are abelian, then you can still use this trick to prepare non-abelian states. So let me give an example of simplest state, not a be able to state to prepare. Uh, that's the group F3. So S3 is the permutation of three objects, but you can also think of it as a symmetry of the triangle. So there are two symmetries, a Z3 symmetry, which is the rotation, and a Z2, which is the reflection of the triangle. So how do we prepare this? Well, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first gauge the Z3 symmetry, followed by gauging a Z2 symmetry to prepare this S3 group. So what do we do? We start with some, for example, a two-level system, which is a qubit, three-level system, which is a qtrit. You first gauge the bottom layer to prepare a Z3 torque code. But now, if you immediately gauge the top layer, then they'll not talk to each other. You'll just get a Z2 torque code times a Z3 torque code. That's still abelian. The, what makes this non-abelian is that the Z2 acts on the Z3, right? If you rotate and reflect, that's like rotating the other way. So you need to make the, the, the Z2 act correctly on the Z3. And you can do that with a finite depth circuit. Uh, I, I've just written this uh, schematically, but roughly what it's doing is that 
for your queue trip, the three state, you keep the zero state invariant and you swap the one and two state. That's this operator. And you sort of have some control gate to perform this uh, conjugation in your queue trip. Once you apply this circuit, now they're coupled. And if you go ahead and uh, gauge the Z2 symmetry, it turns out you'll get exactly S3 top plot word. Yes. Yeah, isn't that like uh, really like depend on that this S3 or if more they are like they can have a semi product structure? Like oh, oh uh -huh. almost like F5 or something. Yes, yes, yes. That's what I'm exactly going to get at there. There are certain groups where you cannot use the string. Yes, yes. But for those you can, um, you can decompose it into abelian groups and then you can do this trick. Yes. So, so for example, for S3, this is what you would do. If you didn't have this unitary in the middle, you would just get Z2 times Z3, which is still abelian. So this unitary uh, is important. Um, and how do we do the gauging? Of course, by measurement. You measure, you might find some, uh, some, some uh, abelian anions. You pair them up before you do the next uh, round of measurement. So um, you can generalize this uh, similarly to, for example, let's do the next uh, uh, harder example. So for a general group extension, uh, my claim is that you can always break it down into a, let's say, a, let's say and let's say the normal subgroup and the quotient subgroup are both abelian. Um, uh, you can just gauge the normal subgroup first, apply some unitary, which will depend on the data of the group extension, um, and then gauge the quotient group. And this unitary, actually, you can think of it exactly as a symmetry, uh, 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 a unitary that prepares the symmetry in which topological state. So you can think of it as the unitary that takes you from the usual Torah code for the, to the one that is enriched by this quotient symmetry Q. And this unitary will depend on the type of group extension you use. And the claim is that uh, uh, you cannot do this uh, by measuring, but you can break it up into a billion parts, each of which can be uh, performed by measurement. Okay. Now, the most general construction then would be uh, what are the non abelian groups that we can break down into abelian groups? Mathematicians know that answer. That's exactly what people call solvable groups. Um, so uh, a, a quick uh, way to think of a solvable group is if you want to know it's, it's whether it's solvable or not, take that group G, compute its commutator subgroup and the commutator of that, and you keep going. And if you reach the trivial group, um, that group is solvable, it turns out. And if you have the sequence, um, that gives you a way to build it back up. So you sort of start from the trivial state, you gauge N1 to prepare, for example, N1 Torah code, you apply some unitary to entangle, you gauge the difference or the quotient of, for example, N2 over N1 to get N2, and you build your way all, all the way up back to G. So, and the number of rounds you have to measure corresponds to the so-called derived length of LG, how many times you have to do this commutator subgroup. Okay. So for example, abelian groups, you only need to measure once, meta abelian groups, the ones that I talked about in the previous slides, the S3 or the dihedral group, need two rounds. Okay, now, of course, uh, uh, some of you are already, already know what I'm going to talk about. This. Are they states we think we cannot prepare using measurements? And that ties to some very interesting mathematics and uh, related to things that are non solvable. And so, um, this gentleman, Galoa, has told us that. Um, uh, a basketball, a basket, playing basketball is easy, playing volleyball is easy, but soccer is really hard. So what that means is um, the symmetries of the basketball and the volleyball are solvable groups, but the symmetry of the soccer ball turns out to be this uh, S5 group, and that is not solvable. So if you want to prepare a gauge theory with the symmetry of a soccer ball, uh, we think you still can't do it with a finite depth circuit and measurements. So, um, so we put this as a conjecture because we do, we do have a physicist proof that you cannot do this, but it's still not rigorous in mathematical grounds yet. So we, we think it's true, but it still needs to be proved rigorously. So oh, why, why, does, why does the symmetry of the soccer ball matter? You might be familiar with another separate fact that if you have a, a quintic polynomial, a polynomial of degree five or larger, then the, there's, no, uh, there's no solution in terms of radicals. And, and the reason that 
that follows from this is be related to the fact that the, the roots of the polynomials may have this large symmetry and you cannot break it down into simpler groups and that's why you cannot write it in iteratively in terms of deep radicals. So it's interesting that uh, this mathematics relating to the quintic polynomial somehow tells us something about uh, preparing topological states. Yes. So much for basketball from the body here? Uh, no, it might not be at the top of my head now. I think this is S4 but I, or A4, but I have to check. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry? How, how do you know that's... Oh, oh, oh. One, one way I know it's solvable is um, anything, any group smaller than A5 or order less than 60 is solvable. So, and and this, this thing looks simpler than the soccer ball, so it should be solved. <laughs> For S5, uh, the fast condition we can like get is like this extensive uh, fast searching for the reason of the like how long the reason of the be. Oh, right, right. Or just prepare it with the linear depth circuit. So there are ways to, for example, just gradually grow it out. That's also another way to prepare it. And we think that is the best way with unitaries only. Um, with measurements, turns out there's a recent paper by Tim Shea which showed that um, you can actually prepare it with log L's. So it's a bit better. But we don't know whether that's an optimal bound or not for these non-solvable things. Okay. So uh, let me talk about uh, further restricting a condition. And I want to talk about measurement as a scarce resource. So for example, let's say I want to minimize the number of rounds of measurements and we have to do to prepare the state. And you may ask, oh, why do we care about this question? Well, it, act, it surprisingly has both a theoretical and, and sort of experimental uh, importance. On the experimental side, well, experimentalist tells us that this measuring something in the middle of the circuit and feed for it, that's a very expensive thing. And it might take longer, uh, might take much longer time than applying a deep unitary itself. So if we want to uh, use measured measurement circuits, we should use them uh, as a few number, a few round, at least round them as possible. Okay. Um, but for the theoretical side, that's also interesting because. Uh, I, I said previously that topological phases are all hard to prepare with unitary. They all require linear depth. But if we ask how many rounds it takes to prepare uh, a topological phase with measurement, how many rounds of measurement you need, it might grade them into a hierarchy of which states are simpler than others. So with the in, for example, all these solvable groups, we can still grade them into uh, ones that are easier to prepare in terms of number of measurements than others. Okay. But let me even restrict even more. Uh, let me ask, let's take the extreme case. What if I only am around, uh, uh, I'm, I'm only allowed one round of measurement. Uh, what if I only got one shot? Is there anything you can prepare that is not an abelian topological order, which are always captured by stabilizers? You can always prepare that by stabilizer state. So you only need one round of measurement. Um, can you prepare anything that is not abelian it only requires one round of measurement. And the answer surprisingly seem is that if you go from not the symmetry of the triangle, but the symmetry of the square D4, surprisingly, you can prepare it in one round. So let me explain how that happens. So let me tell you the naive way which you would use two rounds of measurement. You can write down this D4 group as a semi-direct product. So you have two Z2s. For example, you can think of the horizontal and vertical reflection and they're interchanged by this diagonal reflection. So this is, this is how you decompose D4 into three Z2. So how would you do that? Let me gauge the normal subgroup first, Z2 times Z2. That means I would create two Tor codes like this, right? So how, what do I do? I would measure uh, the anions in each layer, E1 and E2, I pair them up, and then uh, I gauge the swap symmetry, which is second round. But why can't I measure both of them at the same time? What happens is, suppose I did not pair up the E1 and E2. We know that the swap symmetry would permute E1 into E2. So if you gauge that symmetry, these two anions will transform into each other and they form a doublet. So that would give you some non-abelian anion within D4. And if you prepare and, and if you let these uh, charges stay until that state, when it becomes non-abelian, then you have trouble uh, pairing them up. That would, that would now require a linear depth. 
So you want to fix it before, and that's why you had to use two rounds of measurement. So that was the naive problem. However, uh, actually, there are many ways to prepare a two copies of Torah code. A different way, which turns out to be better, is what if you measure not E1 and E2, but two other things, the bound state E1, E2, and the bound state M1, M2. So in terms of Torah codes, you would sort of measure the product of two of the vertex terms and two of the plaquette terms at the same time. Why is that good? Well, E1 and E2, the, the bound state E1, E2, does not transform as a doublet now. It's, it's invariant, so it transforms as a singlet. So if you gauge the swap symmetry, it will still remain a bit an abelian anion. It doesn't transform into anything, so it's still a one-dimensional guy. Okay, so, so which means that if you measure E1, E2, M1, M2, and the swap uh, chart, you can measure all three at once, and you would prepare the for top line order. So uh, this not actually does not work for S3, but for certain groups such as D4, uh, this trick works. So what states can we prepare in one shot? Um, that turns out to be non-abelian phases that admit a Lagrangian subgroup. What is a Lagrangian subgroup? Uh, that's a group of abelian bosons which have mutual grading and they're closed under fusion. So as long as I can find uh, my, if I can group in my anion, group my anions uh, and find enough abelian bosons such that when I condense them, it confines every other anion. Then that gives me a short range entangled phase, which turns out to be a symmetry protected topological phase protected by this group A, actually. So, in order to reverse this, I just need to prepare a symmetry protected topological phase protected by A and then gauge that asymmetry. So, it turns out that what I was doing in the previous slide, if you rethink of this M as secretly some other charge or some other group, then there are three Z2s. And then I can gauge a Z to cube SPT to also prepare this D4 topological order. Okay. And this allows us to prepare D4 in one shot by sort of rethinking what we normally think of as fluxes as, as secretly charges. If we uh, use that uh, picture, then that insight allows us to prepare in one shot. Okay. So what I've shown, I'm going to wrap up the theory part now. But I just wanted to conclude that I've shown that we prepared Tor code in one shot. Surprisingly, D4 can also be prepared in one shot. S3, we think, needs two rounds. And this gives us a hierarchy of things you can prepare, but how many rounds you need to use to prepare them. And of course, there are these uh, non, uh, uh, non solvable groups, um, such as A5 or S5, which we think cannot be, uh, cannot be prepared in uh, finite time, even using measurement. So this gives you, the red box gives you a large a new equivalence class, sort of as if there are like phases of matter if you include measurement as a resource. And the notion of solvability actually extends beyond groups. You can even go to more general categories such as Fibonacci anions, and Fibonacci anions also have the property that they're not not solvable. Okay, and there's an interesting connection. It seems it seems that in the literature people talk about these non-solvable ones as universal or quantum commutation by Brady alone. And moreover, it seems that there are, certain, uh, there are certain phases which are also universal if you include measurement as a resource. But to the best of our knowledge, it seems that all of these require two rounds of measurement. So it seems interesting whether there's a relation, deep, any deeper relation between things that require more than one round of measurement to prepare and its universality quantum computation. So, so what's the intrinsic difference between this S3 and D4? Um, mm -hmm. If you have a like emotional support, or you have many like N figures of magnetic energy, mm -hmm. like, that is why you cannot directly translate this to D4. Right. My guess is because S3 you mix between a qubit and a Q trick, whereas for D4 you can always do everything in qubits. So the non-universality comes from playing around with things that are, for example, Clifford in one but not Clifford in the other. And that happens when you mix different uh, primes together. Here, you only have one prime, which is two reds. Even though you have many and two reds. And right, right. In, 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 a, in a fault tolerant way, right? Yeah. Of course, there are other techniques which don't require topological stuff, such as magic state injection. But this is, this is just using uh, uh, vibrating and measurement alone, and you want it to be fault tolerant. Okay, so 
Um, any questions before I move on to uh, now talking about the experiment? Um, do, do you have a negative example for the one shot? Like, for example, do you know something that definitely cannot be prepared in one shot for two of these? Uh, I think, well, using our protocol, I think S3 cannot be prepared in one shot. Of course, it does not exclude the possibility that there are some other ways that measurement can do, which is not covered by the protocol, which is why when I said this conjecture, it's uh, up to up to uh, this specific protocol. We, we have a, a more rigorous argument, but it's still, there's some, there's some uh, details to be filled. Okay. So let me talk about the experiment. Actually, I lied a bit. There's a bit more theory I need to talk about before we can get to experiment, but that's going to build up on pre what I previously talked about before. Um, just, I just want to provide some more intuition on what the wave function of this non-abelian state we're preparing is. OK. So let me recall a bit what the Tor code wave function looks like. And let me thank Rahul for this joke of the Tor code wave function is a, a, a supervision of all, all closed loops, including this one. And we have uh, a bunch of uh, local rules, which allows us to deform, for example, the, tor the, the strings you can deform freely in the wave function of the Tor code to be go between different snapshots. And of course, if you open up these uh, the loops, these are abelian endings. Now, the state I want to prepare, this D4 topological order, I, I mentioned that you can think of it as uh, three sort of three Z2s, but they're coupled in an intricate way. So imagine you have three colors now. So you have three different fluctuating loops, but with the very simple modification. When the three loops intersect and one crosses over the other, you get a minus sign. And similarly, for example, if the green and blue are crossing and you create a red circle, this will, the wave function also differs by a minus sign. So they're not all plus. And it turns out that this simple modification will actually give you non-abelian anion. Um, let me explain first that why, how, how easy it is to add this minus sign. And that comes back again to this uh, decorated domain wall picture, where um, what we do is we can start with a lattice with three colors, right? So three items in, in red, green, blue. And for every triangle, there is an operator you can act on. It's a unitary called control, control Z. What control control Z does is whenever all the spins are flipped down, you add a minus sign. And that's capturing exactly when these three strands pass each other, you add a minus sign to the wave function. But let me give you a bit more intuition. And it's related to the cluster state I, I talked about at the beginning of the talk. Okay, so first, similar to the 1D cluster state, um, you imagine taking the red uh, spins and putting writing them in the up-down basis that gives you this uh, red domain wall. And if you, uh, let's, so for example, this spin is up, this spin is down. So the region connecting them is this red domain wall. But notice that it's passing exactly where the blue green spins are. And now we look at this four spin configuration. What control control Z is, is a controlled operator of control Z, which means that when there is a domain wall, you will only apply control Z once. But I mentioned that control Z is exactly creating the cluster state, 1D cluster state, which means that this wave function is a superposition of red domain walls with a 1D green blue cluster state decorated on it. Okay, and by symmetry, the green, the green domain walls have red blue cluster states on it, and the blue domain walls have red green cluster states on it. That's the wave function. Now, why do we get not a B line anion? So recall that the so I said that the red. Uh, the red domain walls have a 1D cluster state on it. But now if the, cu the cluster state domain wall is allowed, if the domain wall is allowed to end, that gives you my flux. But we know that the 1D cluster state has a two-fold degeneracy on each end. Right? This can be broken, by the way, if we explicitly break the symmetry. But now after I gauge all the symmetries, right, the symmetry becomes unphysical. And so I cannot uh, break that by a local interaction anymore. So this endpoint becomes robust. It has some, uh, it has a dimension two, and that's, that's exactly my non abelian anion. So you should think of the non abelian anion as coming from an endpoint of a, of a 1D cluster state. And the same for the green 
lines ending and the blue lines ending. So the only difference from the Tor code is that the flux now becomes a non abelian particle. Okay, so uh, so the, the, the conclusion is uh, gauging this particular Z2 cube SPT with these three colors uh, with this minus sign at simple minus sign at, added in will actually make non abelian anions. Um, and if you're, uh, in case you speak the language of twisted quantum doubles, this is just uh, saying the fact that uh, the double of uh, D4 is equivalent to uh, the double of D2Q with a certain uh, three loop cycle. Okay, so now I'm ready to talk about the experiment. And I want to just mention uh, this trap ion processor that we use. So uh, what is this trap ion processor? It's continuous H2 trap ion processor. And they have this racetrack configuration where they are able to hold up to 32 qubits with all-to-all uh, -all connectivity. Um, and you can see that, for example, their single qubit fidelity uh, is like 10 to the minus, of order 10 to the minus five, and their two qubit fidelity is 10 to, infidelity is 10 to the minus three. So very good, uh, very good fidelities for the, the state. And the all-to-all -all connectivity comes from the fact that they can shuttle these ions around this racetrack and uh, they can put two into some interaction zone, shine some lasers on it, such that you perform these two qubit gates. And they were well separated from, from the rest of the cube, from the rest of the atoms. So there's uh, also a little crosstalk, for example. Okay. So um, the model that we prepared, um, so out of the 32 qubits, we have a final state consisting of 27 qubits. And what we did is, uh, we put them on this, uh, we interact them. So all the action interactions are local and we put them such that they're on this affected geometry, which is a torus. So we put 27 qubits on the affected torus. You can think of it as a Kaggle-made lattice with three sides per unit cell and on a three by three grid. And for each unit cell, you can color it red, green, blue, red, red, red. So, um, to explain what the state I'm preparing is, it's easier to explain what is the mutual eigens, uh, eigen, eigen uh, vector of. So it's a mutual eigenstate of these operators. These operators actually don't commute, but the state I prepare nevertheless is the mutual plus one eigenstate of all these operators. So there's some 12 body operators with X and control Z and some three body operator of uh, Z. Now, it's very similar to the Tor code in the sense that suppose you just ignore control Z, what control Z looks like for now, just ignore that ring in the middle um, and only look at the green qubits, then you can see that it, it secretly looks like a Tor code. For example, the green, the star term, right, looks like a vertex term of the green Tor code. And then this one looks like a bouquet term of the Tor code. But there are three of them and they're sort of coupled intricately with this control Z. And that control Z is just taking care of that minus sign I added to the wave function that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's very similar to three Tor codes. So the excite, some of the excitations you can label E and M like the Tor code. So E will be uh, charges and they are exactly the same. Um, a closed loop of that will be, uh, or the Wilson loop is the product of Z. And so a closed loop creates this guy. But the non-abelian fluxes are now M, they become, the M's are now non-abelian, and you would create them with a string of product of X and product of control Z. I'm not gonna go into the details of what they actually look like, but you can, for example, put them around the torus, or if you made a closed loop, that'll create exactly this operator, for example. So how do we prepare the state? Well, we can start with that uh, triangular lattice I mentioned, um, use some unitary circuit, which adds some phase, that to add that minus one sign at the appropriate places to prepare the SVT, then we do this process of gauging. So gauging consists of applying control Z and then doing this projection, which is in itself obtained by measurement and feed forward. And if you go through that for starting with the triangular lattice I mentioned, going through all that steps, prepare exactly uh, the, the geometry I outlined, which is the Kagome lattice. Okay. And so after we prepare that state, what can we measure? Well, let's measure all these uh, quote unquote stabilizers, right? The, the operators, star terms and uh, the, the triangle terms. And we find that, so we expect these in the ideal case to be 
plus one, right? And we find that they're all, most of them are all in the 90s range. So very good uh, uh, values for the expectation values. We also measure the logical operators, which corresponds to tunneling E around the torus, and they're also high. And this allows us to bound the fidelity of the state for a site to be 98.4%. So a very high fidelity of, of state with repair. Okay. So uh, I've shown that how to prepare uh, non abelian yes. Right. It's basically from these information, from the uh, values of the plaquette or uh, the, the readout of these operators, uh, you can use that to bound how far you are from the ideal state. So just the these deviations, you, you crunch the numbers and this gives, that gives you this final number. But, but you achieve high fidelity because what do you? What do you do? What's the trick? Oh, well, of course, the, 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 the trap ion is good, right? They have very, uh, the, their, their two qubit gates, for example, have 10 to the minus three. Of course, the circuit takes a bit to build it up and the measurement, right? So, but all those together uh, reflects in this final value. Okay. So I've shown that we prepare. Yes, yeah, so the only thing trap ions, this will be. The hypothetical can be that high if I do other. No, no, no. I mean, but... as long as long as the quantum device has good, good parameters, right? Um, we only the 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 reason we use this was because they they had, for for example, um, auto out connectivity, which helps us with certain experiments. For, uh, I'm going to talk about how we need non-local interaction to do a certain to do the Brady experiment, for example. And for example, they also helped us to use to put it on a torus. Right. If you have a fixed planar geometry, you would have to care about the boundaries. But with auto all connectivity, you can just put it on effective torus and you don't need to worry about the, the boundaries. Yeah, so that, that was one advantage of using a trap diet. Okay. Um, uh, can we so come back? Sorry, I have another question. Can we, can we come back to that? Uh, so what we discussed earlier on in the talk about the ferromagnetic phase and stability and they have a certain range of, uh, you know, you'll, you'll start to see the, uh, it'll break down before the system size. So mm -hmm. can you, can you uh, uh, discuss that range in the context of this, uh, of this situation? So, so, um, so in terms of stability, it is, it is true that, um, it is true that for any 2D phase, for example, 2D Torah code or any 2D topological order, it will not be robust to finite temperature. So if your protocol deviates by a bit, it will also be unstable. But nevertheless, uh, this is not what we did in the current experiment. But in the future, you might uh, envision um, instead of uh, measuring one round, doing multiple rounds of measurement and performing feed forward to do error correction. So if you do error okay, correction, yeah, sure. then you can still um, do something interesting with it. For example, people use the 2D Tor code, which of course, when you prepare it, it has is sort of the state itself is unstable, but if you do the measurement repeated multiple enough of times and correct it, you can still uh, get fault tolerance, for example. Um, yeah, I guess I was just hoping like this fidelity of being so high, does that lead, you know, can I think of that physically as being close to stable in some, you know, uh -huh. in some way? Um, I mean, the, right, so the fidelity being high, that's an, of course a nice thing, but of course it does not say, it does not ref it does not tell you about whether it's stable or not. For example, you might be close you might be close to the actual state, but you're on some sort of relevant perturbation that'll take you away from the fixed point state. Right. So, so it does not really tell you about the stability. It's just reflecting. This is just one number, so it does not tell anything. But it's just nice to see that it's a high number. Okay. Any other questions? from the audience. Okay, so of course we prepared this very nice say, we show that it's close to the ideal. Um, are there any other things we can use to confirm that we actually prepared a non abelian say? And for that, let me talk about four things we checked that uh, we used to prepare, uh, and we used to uh, uh, determine that we prepared an interesting state. Uh, so first of all, um, it turns out that on the torus, this D4 topological order has 22 ground states. 
And by ground states here, I just mean that, so of course there's no Hamiltonian here. So what I mean by ground state just means that there are 22 indistinct, locally indistinguishable states. You cannot tell them apart other than measuring something non-local on a torus. And that just means that there are 22 states where all the stars and triangle terms are plus one. So uh, it turns out that um, uh, there are these 22 states where you can tunnel different fluxes around the torus. And uh, I've shown you all 22 here uh, for different colors. You can measure all that. Uh, the stabilizers after you've done this tunneling. So we can do this tunneling with the string operator I mentioned, right? And you measure out the uh, expectation values. And this is just the average, I'm just reporting the average value for the star market operators, for example. And these are also I values. So we prepared all these 22 ground states. The interesting about this 22 is that um, for any abelian topological state that admits a gap boundary, for example, if it's non chiral, um, the this number will always be a square. So if you find something that's non-square for something that has a gap boundary, it'll it'll uh, it'll it has to be non-abelian. The second one is well, I mentioned that this is very similar to uh, three copies of the Torah code. So you would naively expect that on the Torah there are sixty-four ground states, but I only mentioned twenty-two. So what happens to the rest? And the answer it turns out about to come back to this cost shift state thing again, where um, I mentioned that, for example, let's consider right uh, tunneling the red flux on the in the x direction and the green flux in the y direction. Shouldn't this also be a ground state of uh, this D four? Um, what happens is it turns out that it's not because you get a single anion excitation and a single red, uh, blue anion excitation on the torus. And that cannot happen actually if it was an abelian model. The, the, the way to see this is because recall that my wave function has uh, a green blue cluster state on uh, red domain walls. And so with this green uh, domain wall passing, you can think of it as, as if you're inserting a flux, a green flux into this green blue cluster state. And that means that that domain wall has a single charge, right? But it's the same intersection for both the red and the green. So there's actually a single excitation uh, around the torus. There's only a single uh, intersection between the red and green. So you find that at this intersection, you're going to have a blue chart. That blue chart is noted here, where we have a minus sign, and we also uh, denoted uh, the color here to see. But you can see that the expectation value of the z operators around the torus are flipped, both of them to minus but you still see this uh, single anion on the torus. So for abel any abelian phase, uh, this cannot happen. You cannot have a single anion on the torus, but surprisingly, you can have that for non-abelian anions. And if you count out of all the 64 ground states, which of them have odd number of uh, charges, you'll find that it's exactly 64 minus the 22, which are actual ground states. Okay, so that solves the conundrum. Why 64? Uh, why not all 64 are ground states? Some of them are excited states with an odd number of charts. The third is the picture I showed you in one of the first slides is uh, you take this rating and it topples the fusion outcome. So um, you can take, uh, for example, the green flux and the blue flux, take two of them, grade one around the other, and fuse them back together. Um, so uh, for example, you create the green and the blue, they're showing it explicitly on the lattice. You, 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 uh, you fuse the green back, um, you see one of the charges pop out, and then you fuse the blue back, you see another charge pop out. And this corresponds exactly to this picture. Um, why does that happen? Well, again, we can use our cluster state intuition. Uh, for example, the blue, uh, the, blue, uh, the blue flux has a red-green cluster state. Uh, sitting on it. Once you thread a green flux, right, which is like a green domain wall, you're going to get a red charge. So the red charge has to pop out out of this uh, fusion. And similarly, this green loop is pierced by the blue flux. So that's why you have a red charge popping out of it. Okay. Um, the last point I want to make, is, and perhaps the most interesting one, is uh, non abelian braiding. So it's amusing to note that uh, these non-abelian anions sort of have like a PhD in knot theory or link theory. So for abelian anions, for example, the Torah code, 
you can bring E and M around each other and in space time it forms this link and you know that this link is minus one, but abelian anions are only sensitive to pairwise linking. So for example, if it's linked, it's minus one. If it's not linked together uh, pairwise, then you won't get such a phase. Um, but you can consider the following uh, link, which is, the, which is called the Borromean ring. And it has some uh, fun history in terms of uh, Italian families. Uh, it symbolizes the fact that since these two uh, pairwise are not linked, right? Uh, if any of them betray, then their uh, thing will fall apart. But here it's just saying that pairwise, red and blue are not linked. If you look carefully, red goes exactly under blue, but the three are actually linked together. And so if any of these were abelian, right, this sign would be plus one. So the so this is sort of like a, a signature of non-abelian anions. If you notice something that's not one, it must have meant that all three that participated were non-abelian. Okay. So here is uh Rough proof of this Borromean rating. How do you, how do you, how do you see why this thing is minus one? Well, take that previous picture I did. You take green and blue, and you have this red charges pop out. The red charge can be detected by the red flux. You just spray them around each other, and then now the top part of this diagram is I just undo what I did at the bottom. Okay, so this will give you a minus one roughly. But there was no reason to fuse the green back together. You know that when you brought the two greens close together, that secretly had to have a red charge. You know that when you fuse them back, there, there'll be a red charge. So you know that this pair had a red charge secretly stored somewhere. So you did need to fuse them back and just push them through, right? So I opened this up. The red charge never appeared anywhere. Similarly here, I opened up the blue. I never fused them back together. I just undo this picture. But now if you stare at this, it's topologically equivalent to the Borromean ring. So that's some intuition on why this Borromean ring uh, braiding will give you a minus one phase factor. Okay, so it's interesting to see that all of this you can get intuition from just, just knowing what the cluster state does. Yes? So it seems that the case two loop, uh, green loop and blue loop, they connect together, you get this net matrix, but why you have the uh, E particles all along? I, I don't understand this thing. Oh, 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 I think that one you have to sum over, let's see. I think you have to sum over all fusion channels, right? Is that right? Um, um, let's see. I think that has some implicit sum in it when you comp compute the S matrix. Um, so for uh, the S matrix, the definition of the S matrix, like you have A and B to ideas, and then you have these two loops that connect together. So I just confused why we do this thing, but you finally get some uh, charge instead of just a number. Yeah, I think I think you have to implicitly sum over something, but it's not coming to me at the moment. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me think about it. And back. Um, unless someone here already knows the end. Um, okay, so this is just intuition for why we can get this minus one phase. How do we do that in, ex in an experiment, right? Because a minus sign, of course, in a wave function, it's just a relative phase. So how do you, you would detect that? Well, then you need an ancilla. So, okay, let me explain first that, of course, in space time, you can draw out this diagram and perform the braiding. This is what we did on the lattice roughly. But now how do we detect this phase? Because it, a phase, of course, does not mean anything in a wave function. Well, then you need to control this operation. You need to introduce an ancillary qubit to this whole operation and say, let's start in the plus state and then control this whole gradient. So you might notice how deep this circuit is. Um, so if you start in the plus state, right? And if the if this ancilla was up, you do nothing. If the ancilla was down, you do this gradient. And this gradient would have theoretically give you a minus one, which means that you started with up plus down and you ended with up minus down, right? If, if you did this operation. So the plus state will have rotated to the minus state. And so the phase of the braiding is exactly the angle is sweeped in the X, Y plane, this ancillary. So in order to do that, um, this is going all over the lattice. So, and this ancilla has to sit somewhere. So you can only sort of do this experiment if efficiently, if you had long, range or all to all interactions, right? So, and the fact that 
uh, experimentally, we, we expect e to the i pi. We found that the the, the sign of this uh, the sign of this the argument of this uh, expectation value we calculate is very close to e to the i pi. So it's just remarkable how how uh, close you can get uh, from uh, to the actual value for for this experiment. I still don't get the because I don't know. Did you ask? Um, Maybe, maybe let me just I have just two more slides and then and then and then so that we can just uh, end it because I think I'm running almost over time. Okay, so other fun facts I didn't weren't able to talk about today, but was still interesting is um, in the very first paper we showed that um, in general we expect that measuring SPT phases um, should give rise to long range entangled states. And the argument we use there is related to some anomaly that excludes a featureless state. For example, you can think of the Tor code as having a mutual anomaly between the E anion and the M anion. And you can sort of argue using that fact that uh, if you had such an anomaly in the final state, it must be um, long range of thing. Um, the second is um, in addition to gauging a bosonic symmetry, you can actually generalize it to perform, for example, the Jordan Wigner transformation and its generalizations to higher dimensions, which you can think of it roughly as measuring a Gauss law of a fermionic gauge theory. So it would be interesting if, you, for example, you prepare me some fermionic theory and then I can perform a gauging to give you the gauge version, which will be bosonic. Uh, third is that you can ask about chiral phases are they easier or hard to prepare? We still think it's hard to prepare if you have exact strict local unitary circuit. But if you allow me, for example, Hamiltonian evolution, and these Hamiltonian can have some sort of like long range uh, decaying, but decaying correlation, we think you can still prepare uh, um, uh, chiral stuff, for example, chiralizing anions or the Laughlin state, for example. Um, and the last is the stability of preparation, which came up as questions a lot during the talk. Um, there are certain preparations which have stability to it. For example, the 2D GHZ state or the 3D Tor code if you prepare it by measuring the plaquettes instead of measuring the vertices. And there's uh, some interesting theoretical work related to that. And actually, even more recently, we collaborated with IBM and um, um, showed how you could uh, uh, prepare the 2D GHZ state in this way, but moreover, even tune through the phase transition and uh, it's and find uh, that there's a deep relation with, for example, uh, the Nishimori line and the random colonizing model. Okay, so some outlook. Um, we prepared a non abelian state. And so for future, uh, it might be interesting to prepare more powerful states that would be uh, suitable for universal quantum computation by braiding and measurement. And of course, to make that robust, since we don't have an Hamiltonian, we need to figure out how to do active error correction in order to uh, correct for, for noise. And of course, for non-abelian anions, it has been explored a bit in some literature, but still needs to be developed more uh, systematically, especially for particular lattices, or, or for example, for the, the model we constructed or our future model. Um, on the theoretical side, it would be interesting to prove rigorously on a mathematically firm ground that these non-solvable groups or these non-solvable uh, anion theories cannot be prepared with circuits and measurements. And how does this hold up, for example, if you use general quantum channels? Can you prepare something more powerful or is it still the same, for example? Um, the last is this classification of these phases which are equivalent under this measurement. For example, Tor code is now equivalent to the trivial state in, in a more generalized sense. Right. Um, what is there a, a structure in sort of category theory that captures this? We know that category theory has given us some classification of anion theories in terms of multi retensive categories. Is there some similar way to uh, capture this, this structure? Um, and also, uh, it's interesting to note that these gauging from measurements might be interesting to apply to other contexts where measurement is important. For example, when people talk about bloquet codes, uh, one way to think about locate codes is uh, via some condensation, and condensation is what gauging a higher form symmetry. So it would be interesting if these can be ported over to uh, locate code setting. Uh, can you get some sort of prepare some non in, uh, some interesting non abelian locate code in, in in this manner? Um, that that's uh, an interesting open question. 
Okay, so let me stop here and thank you very much. I have a question. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so is uh, I was just thinking about this uh, all to all connections, and we've been talking about topology the whole talk. Uh -huh. And I and I uh, uh, I was curious: is there any any advantage to a topological code if you have all to all connections? Yes, yes, that, that's a great question, and I get asked this often. So it turns I'm out, sure, so. <laughs> uh, even for the Tor code, actually, uh, even with long-range interactions, you still need a linear depth to prepare it. And an easy way to see it is if you started from the product state, um, the final Tor code state has a logical operator that goes all the way around the torus. So the only way to prepare uh -huh. it is still using a linear depth circuit, and it didn't matter whether you had all-to-all -all interactions or not. Uh, so it's still it's it's still uh, you still need a linear depth circuit um, to prepare even if you have long range interactions. So it'll still be in the sense as as states will still be has some stability to long range interact. And and how about like the distance of the code? Like if you have all the all connections, does that mm -hmm. the distance of the code? Um, I do not remember off the top of my head, unfortunately. I assume it's still the same, but I, I'm, I'm not sure I should check that. Yeah, I guess I just, I worry that the, the whole notion of topology, when you have these all to all connections, not really not oh, very helpful, actually. I think, I think it, yeah, there are some papers that show the robustness, or for example, even if you're on a sphere where there are not even any logicals, but you and you say, let's have a Tor code on a sphere, what's the depth of the circuit to prepare it? And there are some papers by uh, Aronoff, for example, that show that you still need, I guess, linear, or it reduces to something uh, still, still, it's still not finite. Um, I don't remember the exact scaling, but it's still not finite. Might be with some law correction, but yeah, I don't remember exactly. All right, thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? Go ahead. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Um. So for the Hamiltonian that you constructed for the experimental implementation, it was like uh, it was like a twisted uh, Z two cubed quantum double, which is equivalent to a D four topological order. I'm wondering like um, whether the actual Hamiltonian you wrote down um, so it, it doesn't resemble the form of like a usual twisted quantum double. So I was wondering whether this was like an ad hoc type construction or, and whether like um, there are ways to write down similar Hamiltonians for other twisted quantum doubles. Uh, yes, so the difference is um, in the usual twisted quantum double, the SPT, the wave function of the SPT you construct came from group cohomology. So there's a group cohomology construction of that. Uh, the SPT I use was, uh, came from decorated domain wall, which is a slightly different construction, but um, it's in the same phase. So there should be some unitary to relate them. Yeah. So it's just a different SPT I started with. That's why the final form looked a bit different. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, what I meant was like in because not the end of this S A B, maybe by definition is something like uh, this is A and N, this is B and N, and they just turn on each other, but over the B is the Dimension, it's very well different dimension. And but in next talk, we will have something like this charge going out of this. I just don't understand why we don't have this kind of charges. We are we are already and we are truly different. But 
Şimdi kaydı şu bir adam da. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if there's some sort of projection or some sum involved, but yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head at the moment. Maybe we can like also discuss later. <laughs> I mean, the question is about how to relate uh, is the bromine ring gradients to modular S. Then there are some result based on surgeries that I know. I think some of my previous work I did this. It's like uh, you can start with the three dimensional torus. Instead of lines that only X, Y, Z, the three directions, and then do the tubular neighbor who cut it out the line of directions on, along the line, initially X, Y, Z, with those insertions. And then do the modular S transformation on each of the tubular neighborhood, the T2 torus, two dimensional torus neighborhood. And once you do that, you will change the three dimensional torus topology to the three dimensional sphere, while the insertion of the lines along XYZ direction become the following ring linked in the three dimensional sphere. Mm -hmm. So you have the formula just based on the topology of the three magnets relates the torus insertion a lot of three three set of modifications like three modular S. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing we do. I don't know what it's now. So you mean that directly yeah actually it uh, directly has the relation between this and the modular S. Yes. Uh yeah my, my comment again is just forming rings gradient can relate to modular S by three of the modular S. Mm -hmm. well, also it requires some summation because when you do this uh, surgery to cut and go and you need to sum over all the space during the, that uh, regoing process. Yeah, I, I, I can give a link for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I No, I think we should sing that again. Thank you very much. Thank you.